ask you about that vote by mail. And I know uh, you got to get going here in a minute, but I want to ask you about the the vote by mail. And I, and I want to say, like, also, this is one of those issues where I think uh, uh, an outpouring by the American public has a lot of resonance because I, I think there is a real attempt to attack the Postal Service in a way that is quiet. And if there's a sense by politicians that the American public is aware of what's going on, I think it's going to have uh, more impact than on other issues. But uh, two things. One, let's just, uh, two last things. Vote by mail. Can the post office do it in a non-logistics um, uh, guy trying to um, uh, handicap the post office? Can the um, post office do it? Can the post office just in the main handle like a rush of ballots uh, across the country? And, and is there a, a question about that in this circumstance? So the answer to that is, is unequivocally, it's not a problem. Those who want to discourage people from voting by mail are, have, have two basic charges. One is it's fraudulent and corrupt. We can get into that after I answer the, first, the, the one you asked. And the other is that somehow there's so many letters that are going to go into the mail, the post office just can't handle it. That's an absurdity. We handle almost, average almost 500 million pieces a day. In seasons of, you know, greeting card time or Valentine's Day or the census or CDC medical information that went to every adult in every household, we can handle that stuff in a heartbeat. And that came from one place. Votes are run by the state. So each state, so let's say there's 100 million more ballots that end up in the mail. I don't know what the figures are going to be. 31 million people, I think, in the last election voted by mail. So let's say it triples. Well, that's not in one place. That's in each state. And it's not the same day. It's as people ask for their absentee uh, vote by mail ballot. The capacity of the post office is huge to handle uh, mailings. We can handle them in heartbeat. Just, just think about how many mailings you get. I mean, I'm, when I say you, I'm talking to the listeners. Around election time, from the candidates. That influx is far greater. I, the last election, I'm in D.C. In the city council election, I probably got 20 mailings within three or four days, multiple mailings often by the same candidate. They all got there on time. So in terms of the capacity, it's literally a piece of cake. If there's ever a hurricane, a fire, a flood, a tornado, an outbreak of COVID, mail just gets moved around. There's processing plants all over the country. That's something we can do in our sleep, and we do it all the, all of the time. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's that people should rest very secure that any influx can be handled. Um, and you were going to address fraud. Like, I don't, I mean, I can't, I can't imagine people think that the fraud that I, I you know, I still can't quite figure out exactly how the fraud's supposed to be uh, committed. You would need to know who is not sending in their ballot and you would need to create falsified ballots and then, and then figure out who's not sending in their ballot. So they don't, there's not two of those ballots sent in. Like, I, I'm not even sure how that would happen in a way that couldn't be discovered. I mean, anybody can try anything, I guess. That's right. But, um, That's right. It's, Sam, you're 100% right. We can only go by history and what the experience shows. And what the experience shows is there's tons of checks and balances. There's signatures that get checked. There's voter rolls that get checked compared to databases from the Postal Service. The states that do this, five states do this by law. Uh, Oregon has been doing it for 19 years at every level of their elections. Over 100 million, 100 million ballots cast in 19 years, 15 cases of voter fraud. That's less than one per year. Compared to how many people are disenfranchised because they can't get to a polling place because it's a work day or the lines are too long or there's not enough machines. So it's a system that's proven to work. Utah has been voting, I think, for, for five or six years, vote by mail, zero cases. California, it's all, it's not by law, but it's voluntarily. Half the people in California vote by mail. And so it, there's, there's absolutely no basis. In fact, I say the claims that it's a fraudulent system, those claims are fraudulent. And, you know, if people want to delay elections, as president floated an idea, it's outrageous. It's, it, it's a step towards tyranny to raise that somehow an election should be canceled or postponed making the Postal Service and postal workers as some kind of scapegoat, or there's something wrong with the results. If 
everything is not counted on November 3rd. That's not the point. The point is everybody has access to the ballot box, and then that vote counts. So we're very confident. Look, we've been doing vote by mail for generations. We're proud of it. Uh, postal workers are not, as a group, are not beholden to any political party, any candidate. This is part of our civic duty and civic responsibility. It's private. It's secure. It works. And by the way, ballots do get priority. And the Postal Service uh, is set up uh, to help states. And the new PMG, to its credit, has said that they're going to have full, the states will have full support once again. And we need to hold them to his word on that. So it is, it, it's really a terrific system. It's more and more popular with each election cycle. People don't have to wait in lines. They can think about their vote a little more. They can vote in, in their own home. They could either mail it back or take it to a drop-off point. And now in this pandemic, literally, this is going to be a question of having access to the ballot box and being able to exercise our cherished right to vote. And we're here to serve. We're confident we can do it. We certainly want to make sure the mail's not slowed down because that affects everything we do. Uh, but the states are going to have to run these elections right, get ballots into people's hands in time. And we urge people to vote quickly. So, uh, Mark, lastly, let me ask you this. In um, uh, in my my fantasy life, it's, it's a little bit uh, narrow and myopic, but in my fantasy life, I imagine um, that the next president comes in, Joe Biden comes in, points a new board of governors. The new board of governors says, not only are we going to... Um, you know, uh, reverse some of these things. We are going to institute something like postal banking and we're going to offer, you know, some very basic banking services since we already have all these retail outlets all across the country. It will uh, provide banking services for people who are unbanked, provide convenient banking services for people like what, um, what, how, how, um, how, uh, I guess wild is my fantasy life, uh, Mark. Sorry to put it in this context. Well, I, I have some of those uh, same fantasies as you, although I don't want to start a rumor. Out. Right. No, I understand. Um, the, <laughs> no, my, my, the, the, the question of expanded and enhanced postal services is really the way to go. And we've been uh, uh, pressing and pushing the postal service to try some new things, even if they do what's called pilot program. And we're not going to wait for a new board of governors, a new president to continue to press that. It's a wonderful place to do some expanded financial services like paycheck cashing, put it on no fee debit cards. Uh, these are things that post offices, posts are doing throughout the world uh, and can easily be done here. And it would really, you know, our, the other part of our mission under the law is to bind the nation together. Those are the exact words. And that includes a lot of things and to be able to provide some basic financial services to hardworking people so they're not getting ripped off. There's 80 or 90 people, that, 80 or 90 million people in this country, the estimates are, that don't have access to regular banking. Either they have no banking or they get stuck in this predatory lending, check cashing industry. And so it would be a great counter to that, another way that the public sector can serve. We could have electric charging stations for cars and a lot of post office. We can have an electric fleet that would be very environmentally sound and that could be shared with the public. Um, so it's, it's, there's just so many things, uh, 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 money transfers, ATMs, uh, all of those things the post office should do. And look, it's not gonna be for free, but it's not gonna be a rip off. So we we'll bring in revenue and it makes the public entity that much more relevant in people's lives. So I don't think that's a fantasy at all. There's some movements within some communities around the country, such as the Bronx and in the area of Cleveland, asking just for this. There's a lot of uh, a lot of people in Congress who are also uh, pressing this, and postal postal workers are excited about doing these kind of services for the. Uh, uh, postal patrons. Uh, in terms of the political environment, look, it, it shouldn't be any secret to anybody that if we have a president of the United States that's calling us a joke uh, and saying the post office should raise package rates on the people in this country four and five times, which of course would drive away, it would not only hurt the customer, it would drive away a heck of a lot of business and revenue. So that's another way to destroy and undermine the postal service. When those things are going on, certainly our executive board, I can only speak for them, 
uh, do want to make a political change. Some of these board of governors, Sam, have terms. So a change in the president, they all have terms. A change in the presidency doesn't change the board of governors, but there's some vacancies and the board of governors uh, 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 could could improve. But I have to say, in all honesty, um, the board of governors made the uh, unanimous right request for COVID relief and robust COVID relief. So that's an indication on that question they were doing the right thing. They seem to be going along, which to me is the wrong thing, on this on these uh, policies of slowing down mail, uh, and they need to jump in on that 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 as well. But uh, we hope in a better political environment that's more supportive of public public services, uh, more supportive of, of workers having unions and. Uh, uh, union rights and more supportive of new ideas and what the post office can and should be that uh, things will get better. So we, we, but whether there's a change or not, we're still going to be the American Postal Workers Union. Well, still standing for, for justice in the workplace, justice in our communities, and to keep this wonderful national treasure vibrant and strong for generations to come, which is what the people deserve. Mark Dimenstein, uh, president of the American Postal Workers Union. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on, Sam.